Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is John Babb. I am the treasurer of the Gerald R. Ford Foundation. And to many of you out there who are regular attendees of these programs, you're saying, where's Marty Allen? Marty Allen is the chairman of our foundation, and he's the one you're accustomed to seeing up here at the start of these uh, events. And Marty uh, sends his regrets, but he's in Europe. And uh, so he uh, could not be with us uh, this evening, and uh, so I'm filling in for Marty. Uh, before we begin our program, I have one uh, small commercial to deliver, and don't panic, this is really going to be small. Uh, for those of you in the audience who are guests of someone and have not had the opportunity to join the Friends of Ford, there are pamphlets that describe the benefits of being a friend of Ford for as little as $35. These pamphlets will be available to you as you leave. I know for sure that at the gift shop, uh, there's a stack of these available. They will tell you what all you're entitled to uh, from that membership, not the least of which is being on a regular mailing list for the wonderful events uh, such as this. At this time, and that's the end of the commercial. At this time, I'm going to uh, call up Gleaves Whitney. Uh, it's a great privilege for me to uh, introduce Gleaves, who's going to introduce our speaker tonight. Gleaves, as most of you know, is the director for this Howenstein Center for Presidential Studies at Grand Valley State University. And I, can, uh, I just can't overdo my thanks and appreciation on behalf of the uh, Gerald R. Ford Foundation and, and the Gerald R. Ford Museum for the cooperation the great working relationship we have with uh, Gleaves, the Howenstein Center, uh, Mark uh, Murray, and Grand Valley State University. It's a wonderful relationship, and uh, all of you are the beneficiaries of uh, our collaboration on uh, a number of events. And uh, so it's with great uh, honor that I ask uh, Gleaves Whitney to come up and introduce our speaker tonight. Gleaves. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, John, for a very gracious introduction. And in the spirit of uh, ads, I'd like to uh, put in my pitch as well uh, in two, two senses, really. I want to second what John Babb just said about the great working relationship that we at the Howenstein Center for Presidential Studies at Grand Valley State University have with the Ford Foundation and the Ford Library and Museum. And I see Jim Kratz is here and uh, Don and the staff. Uh, at the Ford who works so hard uh, and we work so well together to bring quality events to the West Michigan community in an event like uh, this evening's. Let me also uh, put in a pitch for a, a new program that is starting here at the Ford Museum and that is the Thousand Day Lecture Series. You know, John F. Kennedy wasn't the only president who served a thousand days. Uh, Arthur Schlesinger would uh, perhaps want you to think that, but uh, Gerald R. Ford also served approximately 1,000 days. And so there's going to be a lecture series over the next 1,000 days that commemorates really what uh, President Ford's administration was about by calling on people, drawing people from the Ford administration who had the experience of working with the president, uh, many of whom actually are working still in having active careers, some of them serving in the Bush administration. And uh, also inviting historians to Grand Rapids who also can talk about what uh, President Ford's administration means in historical context. It's a very exciting series. It's also going to have a movie component, and so we're going to mix it up. Uh, so it'll be many different ways to learn more about President Ford's contributions to the United States during a very difficult period in our nation's history. Well, that therein uh, ends my, uh, my commercial pitch uh, for this evening. You know, a couple of weeks ago, I was looking at uh, the New York Times, and I, I always go, go to the uh, obituaries. I find it fascinating to see these insights into history that the New York Times obituary page usually gives you. And I, I ran into uh, the Fred LaRue obituary from just a couple of weeks ago. It was a large spread. Now, I'm thinking, when I first see the name, I think, gosh, it's vaguely familiar. And I see a very large, or a lot of column inches uh, dedicated to this man's life, and I come to find out, uh, it jogged my memory right off the bat, that he had been instrumental in the Nixon administration. 
And what was interesting about the obituary was the extent to which Watergate was covered in the obituary, not necessarily having much to do with Fred LaRue. It was <laughs> as though he, we had to go all the way through the entire, as only the New York Times can do it, we had to go through the entire rigmarole of what Watergate was and that scoundrel Nixon and all that. And, but it was very interesting. It, it was an interesting period piece for our time about how um, an event, a scandal like Watergate, is portrayed in the media. And it's, it, was it was telling that uh, readers still hunger for the truth of what happened. What did Nixon know? When did he know it? And so forth. And uh, it's particularly uh, fascinating when you look at the context of uh, Watergate during a war. Many people are drawing analogies between President Bush being a wartime president and President Nixon being a wartime president. And somehow, sometimes the rules seem to change during wartime in this country. And this makes us vigilant. And Nixon has much to teach us as a result of that. The administration uh, from 1969 to 1974 has much to teach us at that time in history. I have, have read, like many of you, a number of different historians and people who've tried to put the narrative together. Several months ago, when I visited the Nixon uh, Museum in Yorba Linda, California, and became acquainted with tonight's speaker, I realized that uh, tonight's speaker has a way of pulling together many of the elements of Watergate and the wartime experience this country was going through in a particularly deft and perceptive way. I'd like to tell you about our, our guest speaker, John Taylor. He's originally from Detroit, so he's a Michigan man, so we're welcoming uh, home, in a sense, a, a Michigan guy. Uh, following graduation from college and two years working as a newspaper reporter, he went to work for President Nixon in New York City, becoming his chief of staff in 1984. In 1990, after visiting 13 countries with the former president, including Russia and China, and helping on several of the president's books, John became executive director of the Richard Nixon Library and Birthplace Foundation in California. He oversaw the funerals of President and Mrs. Nixon, as well as the creation of the Nixon Center, a nonpartisan foreign policy think tank in Washington. A Nixon biographer, uh, Jonathan Aiken, wrote that Taylor's service to the president was, quote, the best relationship Nixon had enjoyed with an aide since his White House days with Henry Kissinger." Close quote. John writes periodically for newspapers and magazines and has even written a spy novel, which I've started, and I'm, I think it's got a shot at the bestseller list at some point here, the, the next John Le Carre here in our midst. He is married to Kathy O'Connor and has two wonderful daughters. Uh, Kathy is with us this evening. And uh, as are two other uh, friends, a uh, relative and a friend of the family. And he has two great stepchildren as well. And last but not least, John is an Episcopal priest, having been ordained in Los Angeles in January of this year. Well, please welcome John Taylor back to Michigan. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. It is wonderful to have been invited uh, by the Howenstein Center and the Ford Museum to talk about President Nixon on the brink of an historic anniversary in his and our nation's life. I will say that presidential libraries are at their best when they do their work in conjunction with a policy center, just the kind of relationship that's now being forged with the Howenstein Center. It is a paradigm for successful and thriving uh, work at a presidential library and museum. We at the Nixon Library have had to create our own policy center, the Nixon Center, which is an imperfect way to accomplish that. So uh, to Ralph and to all of uh, his colleagues at the center, congratulations for what I know is going to be a very exciting collaboration. Um, as director of the Nixon Library, it's usually uh, I, who am standing up here, uh, talking about the $35 uh, memberships. And so John has done that with skill and elan. I will try to, in my presentations at the library, mimic him. I would like to offer a couple of commercials of my own, however. One is for the aforementioned Kathy O'Connor, who's not only my wife of over two years, but a friend of a quarter century. 
President Nixon's last Chief of Staff and our Assistant Executive Director at the Nixon Library in charge of raising uh, all the money at the Nixon Library, which is the only presidential library still which is operated without a penny of taxpayers' funds. Kathy, it's such a pleasure to have you here. I will try to keep this next uh, personal uh, uh, reflection as short as possible to avoid imposing on you, but my maternal grandmother, Lily Charlie, had a large family of siblings and cousins. She was from Lancashire, uh, England. Her father worked in an oil cloth factory, and Lily's father decided in the fullness of time that they were coming to America, and they booked passage on a liner right after the turn of the century, but the booking agent got a little greedy, greedy because there were a lot of half fares in the family. And the booking agent was selling nothing but full fares on the Titanic. So Lily and her family did not sail. They sailed two weeks later on the Megantic, which made all things possible for my family. <laughs> Once Lily and her family arrived in the US and settled in the, uh, many of them in the Detroit area, uh, Lily's parents had one more child who is now the, Reg the Reverend Reginald Angus, a deacon in the Episcopal Church, resident of Addison, Michigan. And thanks to uh, uh, Gleaves' hospitality, Reverend Reginald Angus is here. Welcome, Uncle. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, in six days, we mark the 30th anniversary of the last moment of the Nixon administration, which, of course, was President Nixon's resignation at noon Eastern time on August the 9th, 1974. In 35 days, as Jim and his colleagues from the Ford Museum know well, will mark the 30th anniversary of what is perhaps the most fateful day in the Ford administration, which was President Ford's announcement that he was issuing a pardon for President Nixon. Many of you, if not most of you, our supporters and neighbors of this institution, which John and Marty shepherd so lovingly along with all their colleagues at the Ford Foundation and on the staffs of the Ford Museum and Library, which are institutions which comprehensively and movingly chronicle the remarkable lives and times of the 38th president and his first lady. When we come to wonderful places such as the Ford Museum and Library to ponder our presidents, one of the questions we naturally ask is whether the leader had the capacity for seeing beyond his moment, for looking over and across the horizon. At the time, of course, President Ford was harshly criticized for issuing the pardon. Many historians will still argue that it likely caused him the 1976 election. And yet in recent years, many have come to the belated conclusion that Gerald Ford was right after all. Among the many who have admitted changing their view is the late Archibald Cox, the first Watergate prosecutor, as well as Washington Post reporter Bob Woodward. They had the ample blessing of hindsight, the president, the more precious wisdom of foresight. Indeed, 30 years later, it is still wise for Americans to listen to President Ford, perhaps now more than ever. He embodies the seemingly scarce political qualities of civility and common sense, the politically unfashionable virtue of moderation. In this era of red versus blue America, a nation which, according to many measures, is divided against itself, President Ford typifies the politics of community and common ground. This manifesto of another great Republican, Dwight Eisenhower, also fits Gerald Ford. It describes his approach to the Nixon pardon and indeed to all things he confronted in government. Eisenhower wrote, no man can always be right. So the struggle is to do one's best, to keep the brain and conscience clear, never to be swayed by unworthy motives or inconsequential reasons, but to strive to unearth the basic factors involved and then to do one's duty. Grand Rapids and Yorba Linda are indeed linked by many common bonds and not so common personalities. Last week, for instance, Henry Kissinger, who served both Presidents Ford and Nixon as Secretary of State, paid one of his frequent visits to the Nixon Library in Yorba Linda, where he serves 
as a trustee, just as he does with John and Marty on the Gerald R. Ford Foundation. Famous for his frank advice to presidents, Dr. Kissinger enjoys reminding me of an occasion when he feels I failed to speak with sufficient courage to one of his two famous bosses. About 20 years ago, I was working as former President Nixon's assistant in New York City, and he and Dr. Kissinger decided they were going to write an article together. They were going to urge President Reagan to do more to bring about a treaty uh, limiting nuclear weapons in Europe. President Nixon wrote a draft of that article, and my, my wife and dear friend Kathy had a hand in that process. I fed it into our brand new fax machine, page by page. A day later, it came back from Dr. Kissinger, completely rewritten. <laughs> President Nixon took a little of Dr. Kissinger's language and sent it back. Dr. Kissinger took a little of President Nixon's language. They pummeled each other in four rounds of championship alpha dog faxing. At last, we had one document, although it bristled with 20 yellow post-its denoting still disputed passages. Dr. Kissinger came to President Nixon's office for a summit meeting. I took notes as they methodically and painfully resolved their differences. As leaders during pivotal years of the Cold War, they were exceptionally precise in their public discourse, especially about foreign policy and matters of life and death. President Ford is, of course, the same way. These are leaders who revered language, its power to inspire and to wound, to worry and to heal, to hedge and to hone in, to provoke or to end conflict. They worked on their article for two long hours that morning, finally settling all issues except for one. In a certain phrase, President Nixon wanted to use the word entirely. Dr. Kissinger wanted to use the word mostly. <laughs> Each made his argument. They sipped their coffee. They chewed on the ends of their felt-tipped pens, and an uncomfortable silence accumulated around us. Finally, Dr. Kissinger turned to me and said the words I had most dreaded. He said, and what do you think? I don't actually remember what I said. <laughs> but Dr. Kissinger graciously and lightheartedly reminds me. He says, of course you were an incredible suck-up. <laughs> you sided with the president. <laughs> Our gathering tonight is timely, not just because of the approaching end of the Nixon administration and the beginning of the Ford administration. During the recent presidential primary season, it sometimes felt like 1972 all over again. Nearly 10 years after President Nixon's death, Democratic candidate Howard Dean denounced President Nixon's so-called Southern strategy, which was ironic since Governor Dean had himself announced that he wanted the votes of men who displayed Confederate flags on their windshield. John Kerry told audiences at his rallies that he was proud of having stood up to President Nixon over Vietnam. For his turn, President Bush was questioned about his service in the National Guard during the Nixon administration. We rely on the commemoration of these important anniversaries, among many other devices, to remind ourselves of events that otherwise might begin to slip behind the veil of memory. But we evidently don't need reminding when it comes to Richard Nixon and the dramatic events of his presidency. In politics, in culture, in our spiritual and family lives, we tend to revisit our foundational stories, sometimes because of their power to inspire us, and sometimes because of the pain and the grief they embody. Most commentators who reflect on the anniversary we will mark next Monday will probably be preoccupied with the trauma of Watergate. But I would suggest that when we think about the Nixon years, the subject that really bedevils us, that haunts our politics, that even influences the way leaders make decisions about war and peace in the age of terrorism, that subject is not Watergate, but the war in Vietnam. In a quarter century working for the former president and now his library, I've had my share of conversations and debates about Richard Nixon. Many have begun with Watergate, as one would expect, but most get around eventually 
to Vietnam. Some examples, some open questions. When President Nixon ordered bombing raids and incursions into Cambodia in 1969 and 1970, was he invading a peaceful, neutral country? Or was he saving lives by taking the battle into sanctuaries the North Vietnamese were using to launch attacks on our troops and our allies in South Vietnam? When he ordered B-52s to attack targets in North Vietnam in December of 1972, was it the act of a maddened tyrant, as his critics said, or a lonely but necessary step to break the will of the leaders in Hanoi and bring our prisoners of war home? After President Nixon and Henry Kissinger brought an end to U.S. involvement in Vietnam with the Paris Peace Accords, did Saigon fall 27 months later on the sad watch of President Ford because of the superiority and skill of the North Vietnamese? Because history was on the side of that crushing neo-Stalinist regime? Or did Saigon fall because despite President Ford's best efforts, the Congress of the United States let South Vietnam run out of bullets? Was Daniel Ellsberg, the Vietnam War architect turned anti-war activist who leaked the Pentagon Papers to the press, was he a hero or was he a rogue? Did the United States have obligations and interests in Vietnam or did she not? These questions are still lively and painful, especially for anyone whose lives or families were touched by that war. These questions will not be resolved by us tonight. But as the guns of Quezon and Tet echo in our politics 30 long years later, it's not hard to see why our nation needed scapegoats for the trauma of Vietnam. So the legacies of President Nixon and his colleagues will be hostages of history as long as that war is debated, as long as its wounds sting us. So I suggest that because the war begat the Watergate scandal because Watergate grew out of America's argument with itself over Vietnam. History should weigh the two subjects side by side. As for the specific links between Vietnam and Watergate, they are innumerable. On a purely practical level, there would have been no one to break into Democratic headquarters in June of 1972 at the Watergate if the Nixon White House had not created the so-called Plumbers Unit to investigate the largest wartime national security leak in human history, namely the Pentagon Papers. And when President Nixon angrily ordered his aides in June of 1971 to blow the safe at the Brookings Institution to find out if officials there were involved in the Pentagon Papers leak. It was the anger of a commander in chief during wartime. It is hard for most of us, of course, to understand what it's like to be responsible for the lives of troops under our command. Today, President Bush must bear the burden, along with their families, of losing 900 courageous young Americans in 16 months in Iraq. At the height of the Vietnam War in 1969, that many young Americans died in eight weeks. Regarding the safe at the Brookings Institution, President Nixon's anger passed. No one went in to blow the safe. But because President Nixon's passion in this matter and in so many others was preserved on tape, the historical Nixon is still called to account by many of us for his anger. I sometimes wonder how FDR might have felt in a similar moment. Think, for instance, about the siege of Corregidor in the Philippines during World War II, when Roosevelt thought he was about to lose Douglas MacArthur and had no way to stop it. What if, at that time, one of Roosevelt's aides told him that a War Department aide turned pacifist, the analog in this hypothetical of Daniel Ellsberg? had taken some pre-war Japanese cables and given them to the press to try to weaken the political case for America's war in the Pacific. Would Roosevelt have gotten angry? We may imagine so. Would history have forgiven him his anger? We hope so. 
And yet, history tends not to lump Richard Nixon with FDR, Abraham uh, Lincoln, and Woodrow Wilson. Our young people are not taught automatically to think of him as a wartime commander in chief. When school children and college students come to the Nixon Library, I often ask them for the first word that comes into their head when they think about Richard Nixon, and they almost always say Watergate. I respond with carefully studied patience. What's the second word that comes into your heads, kids? If there is a second word, it is almost never Vietnam. And yet when I ask them how many of their families were touched by the war, usually a quarter of them raise their hand. And when they learn that President Nixon may have commanded their fathers, uncles, or grandfathers, or indeed even their mothers, grandmothers, or aunts, they seem to regard the displays in our museum with more alert eyes. Of course, by the time President Nixon inherited the Vietnam War in January of 1969, the elite consensus about the war's aims and prospects had almost completely eroded. No one who thought the war illegitimate or even illegal was likely to want to afford Richard Nixon the latitude that most war presidents had enjoyed. By the same token, President Nixon's conceptions of his responsibilities and indeed of the resources available to his office were not influenced by these other people's judgment about whether the war had been a bad idea before his watch. This fundamental disconnect between the president and his critics over the use of his war powers, which was rooted in a disconnect about the morality of the war, helps explain why all of the aspects of the president's Watergate defense that were rooted in some way in national security were not persuasive and eventually became the focus of a certain amount of ridicule. Let me be very clear president used to say. I would not ask history to exclude everything or indeed anything that President Nixon did or said purely on the basis that he was a war president. I merely hope history will remember that he was a war president. I hope history will construe his passions as being legitimately rooted in his profound sense of obligation to our troops and our nation's security and standing in a dangerous and complex Cold War environment. I hope history will understand that his critics in the Congress were subject to passions of their own that were also rooted in their beliefs about the war and America's role in the world. And I hope history will see that some in Congress pursued Richard Nixon with the same determination and even partisan enthusiasm. As Bill, critics, as Bill Clinton's Republican critics did when he was impeached. So I do believe that the historical Nixon remains a work in progress. Perhaps this is just a friend's wishful thinking. Yet as the 2004 campaign amply demonstrates, Richard Nixon continues to provoke strenuous debate. He liked to say, and Kathy heard this often, that in politics the one thing worse than being wrong was being dull. About a politician who's been gone these 10 years, he might have said that the one thing worse than being controversial is being forgotten. And yet one senses in some quarters the desire to pronounce a premature judgment by associating Richard Nixon directly with Watergate's two most notorious acts. On top of the scandal, the cover-up, the tapes, President Nixon's humiliating resignation, some seem intent on finding proof that he ordered or knew in advance of those two important burglaries in June 1972 at the Watergate and in September 1971 at the Los Angeles office of Daniel Ellsberg's psychiatrist, Lewis Fielding. Lacking proof, some writers and journalists proclaim that he must have known about them. Such was the combative mentality of the Nixon White House. Such is the combative mentality of some Nixon historians. The first of these break-ins in Dr. Fielding's office was evidently authorized by domestic policy aide John Ehrlichman, who did not inform the president except to say that an operation had been aborted in Los Angeles over Labor Day weekend 
in 1971. So far, there is no proof whatsoever that President Nixon learned that it had occurred until the spring of 1973, when Watergate was in full flower. This is a vital, vital point. Since the President allegedly covered up Watergate beginning in June of 1972 to keep the FBI from learning of the plumber's illegal activity. But if he didn't know about any illegal activities when the cover-up began, if he didn't learn about them until the spring of 1973, his own account of his actions becomes entirely defensible. Now, as for the Watergate break-in itself, until last year, no one had reliably accused President Nixon of ordering it or knowing about it in advance. Then PBS broadcast a documentary in which campaign aide Jeb Magruder said that he overheard President Nixon authorize the break-in during a telephone conversation with John Mitchell, when John Mitchell, who was then Nixon's campaign chief, and Magruder were together in Florida in March of 1972. Magruder's account contradicted all of his earlier writings and statements. Another campaign aide, Fred LaRue, whom we just heard about from Gleaves, who died just last week, was also in that meeting. He insisted to me in a telephone conversation last year that there was no such call from President Nixon authorizing this burglary. Most important, the White House tapes and logs show that President Nixon made no such phone call. The PBS producers did not seek out Fred LaRue, an eyewitness to the meeting, to try to confirm Magruder's story. If they were aware that the tapes contradicted it as well, they did not say so in their broadcast. Bob Woodward calls the Nixon White House tapes the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> it's unfortunate, however, that PBS failed to give President Nixon the gift of the benefit of the doubt by telling its viewers that the tapes contradicted Magruder's momentous charge. PBS was perhaps too eager to show that it had finally unearthed Watergate's holy grail, to show that it had finally proven Richard Nixon's original sin. Was Watergate indeed merely the result of Richard Nixon's nature? Or was it the culmination of a national argument about war and peace as pained and poisoned as any that had occurred in our country since the Civil War? Richard Nixon believed vital American interests were at stake in Indochina. He also hoped that the, that the United States would give the people of Vietnam and Cambodia the chance to live in freedom. He chose to remain in Vietnam when it would have been politically wiser to withdraw. George W. Bush believes vital American interests are at stake in Iraq and the Middle East. He also hopes that the United States will have given the people of Iraq the chance to live in freedom. He chose to spearhead an invasion of Iraq that would have been politically wiser to avoid. So once again, we find ourselves as a nation divided over a controversial military intervention, divided Democrat versus Republican, blue versus red, multilateralist versus unilateralist, hawk versus dove. The rhetoric is heated and caustic, sometimes even as ugly as during the Vietnam years. I think of Michael Moore's documentary, Fahrenheit 9-11, and people sometimes say it has brought political debate in this country to a new low. I remember when President Nixon was reelected as president and Rolling Stone above the article about his reelection, there was a swastika. There's almost no doubt that history will judge President Bush largely on his decision to go to war in Iraq, just as President Nixon is symbolically associated with America's devastating defeat in Vietnam. At no time since President Nixon's resignation does it seem more advisable to study Watergate with an eye to understanding how policy differences can become political and personal and utterly poisonous. And yet I would conclude tonight by asserting that while a painful and divisive war was the central event of his presidency, no other modern president has done more than Richard Nixon 
to replace the grim reality of war with the driving dream of peace. In the bright sunshine and bitter cold of their first inauguration day in January of 1969, Pat Nixon held a Bible that the President-elect's grandmother had brought from Indiana to Whittier in the 1890s. From his grandmother, whose name was Elmira, and his mother, Hannah, Richard had acquired a dedication to the ideal of peace, a yearning for reconciliation among people. So the Bible Mrs. Nixon held was open to a passage from the second chapter of Isaiah, and my great uncle Reg knows it well. It is God's mighty call to beat swords into plowshares and study war no more. And yet at the moment Richard Nixon lifted his hand from that Bible, he became responsible for the lives of 540,000 young people who had been sent to the other side of the planet under the policies of the prior two administrations to fight in Indochina. Hundreds were falling in battle every week. Besides that, there were worsening relations with Moscow, no relations with the People's Republic of China, no plan for peace in the Middle East. Southern schools were still segregated after a generation of court rulings and stirring rhetoric about civil rights. Our nation was riven by social upheavals no one had imagined just a few years before. Richard Nixon had not created any of these problems. He had answered a call to the far more monumental task of trying to solve them. Historian Walter McDougall, who is a winner of the Pulitzer Prize and who will be at a conference at the Nixon Library beginning on Thursday to discuss many of these matters. Walter says that in 1969, there was no one else who could have stepped into the presidency and accomplished what Richard Nixon did at home and abroad. So a man many journalists and historians portray as utterly tragic in view of the way his presidency ended may well have been utterly indispensable during those pivotal years in view of everything else he accomplished during his presidency. The political odds he faced, of course, were staggering. Despite the best efforts of friends on Capitol Hill, such as Gerald Ford, the minority leader, Congress was in the hands of the Democrats throughout his administration. The trauma of the war, the war that others had begun and that he was trying to end, hung over everything. In some quarters, antipathy to the president had lingered ever since he had exposed the treachery of Alger Hiss. And yet when the Nixons flew home to San Clemente 30 years ago next Monday, the troops and the prisoners of war had already come home from Vietnam. A new relationship with the Soviet Union presaged the beginning of the end of the Cold War. China had rejoined the family of nations. A peace process was in place in the Middle East that would culminate a few years later in the Camp David Accords. And the schools in the Deep South had finally been desegregated, all thanks to President Nixon's vi vision and energy and skill and that of his dedicated colleagues. So on this anniversary next Monday, let us remember these things as well, the working of a presidency as well as its ending, the realized dream of a more peaceful world as well as the tragedy of a misunderstood war. Above all else, Hannah Milhouse Nixon's son wanted to, be wanted to be remembered as a peacemaker. After all, God promised to remember the peacemakers, to number them one by one and call them each by name. And so God will. In the words of Isaiah, then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth because the Lord has spoken. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And, and after that, I'm not sure whether we should say Reverend Taylor or <laughs> Mr. Taylor. Very, very insightful uh, comments. And uh, I think it puts a very controversial presidency in a new light. Now, all of you, when you came into the uh, auditorium, should have received a question card. And we'd like very much for you to take the opportunity now, if you have questions, to fill out this card and pass it forward. 
And also, just if you would like to, uh, please uh, detach this portion of the card and let us know who you are, and you can be on our mailing list and receive uh, all the bulletins out. Well, Kathy, let's steal this idea. And <laughs> <laughs> uh, do leave those uh, with us so that we can contact you. What you just heard was the, the first, the inaugural lecture of the Thousand Day Lecture Series, and I think this is the quality of lecture that you should come to expect that we will be able to offer here at uh, the Gerald R. Ford in cooperation with the Hallenstein Center for Presidential Studies. So if you'll be filling that out, I'd like to ask the first question, sort of the moderator's prerogative here. John, could you please give us more insight into Nixon the man? What was he like to work with on a day-to-day -day basis? What was his personality like? His friend and uh, brilliant campaign fundraiser, Maury Stans, who took a particularly bum rap during Watergate, uh, summed up Nixon by saying he was an introvert in an extrovert's profession. And I think that is fair, if a little bit reductionist. He drew enormous energy from the opportunity to interact. He would have loved being here tonight. He would have enjoyed your questions, interacting with you, feeling your energy, sometimes even feeling your skepticism. So he was, the, he was an introvert, but he drew, he drew energy from people nonetheless. But he just controlled uh, himself to such a degree um, that sometimes he ultimately cut himself off uh, mainly because of the pressures of the presidency during wartime from as much interaction as people as, uh, with people uh, as might have been ideal. Uh, Kathy and I had the enormous blessing of working with him uh, in his office as a former president beginning in 1979 or in 1980. We found him to be enormously engaging. He, we found him to be fair and open uh, and caring towards the people uh, who work for him. Uh, we found him to be almost um, preternaturally youthful in his approach to uh, his work. He was, after all, considered to be disgraced. Um, he just refused to act that way. He got up at 5 in the morning. He read five newspapers. He wrote a memo to the president. Um, he traveled the world six times to uh, the Soviet Union and Russia, seven times uh, to China, uh, uh, meeting with foreign leaders and foreign diplomats, always coming back and giving a private uh, no holds bar briefing to the incumbent president. The thing that he cared about the most as a former president was not so much his historical standing. He was often accused of trying to rehabilitate himself. And he was enough of a student of history to know that he had been part of events uh, uh, tumultuous enough that it would take history the better part of 50 years to sort it all out. The thing that he most conserved and, and gathered was his access to his successors as president. He most cared about having the ear of every president from your own Gerald Ford all the way through William Jefferson Clinton. Having access to the president, mainly to advise him about foreign policy, was essentially the sum purpose of the last 19 years of his life. And I'm sure Kathy would agree with me because she was at his side for that whole time, or much of it. Uh, he had a wonderful sense of humor. Um, he enjoyed being around people whom he trusted. He loved his family. He loved his time with his four grandchildren in Saddle River when he and Mrs. Nixon moved back east in 1980. Uh, they were close to Tricia and Ed and Christopher in Midtown Manhattan and David and Julie and their three children who were in suburban Philadelphia. The Nixons were in New Jersey and so all the grandkids could get there just about every weekend. And they watched movies downstairs in the rumpus room and watched the baseball game with their grandfather. So that while President Nixon's time as president and vice president prevented him being with Julie and Tricia as much as he would have liked, Mrs. Nixon sort of entered the breach there and was parent for both of them sometimes. As a grandparent, Richard Nixon, and many overachievers find this, that as grandparents, they really come into their own as parents. And that was certainly President Nixon's pattern. Um, I found him to be an, just an extraordinary person, and it was a great blessing to have, uh, to have known him. Thank you, please. This question is, in President Nixon's memoirs, he acknowledges mistakes. Did he ever acknowledge doing things that were wrong? I think he acknowledged that uh, he was uh, culpable for aspects of the cover-up. I think he acknowledges that it was wrong not to have found a way to bit, bite the bullet quickly uh, on, 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 on Watergate once uh, it appeared as though a cover-up was underway of the FBI's investigation of the burglary. But he was never as contrite as his critics wished him to be. 
It was in part because it was not in his nature to give up, and that meant including giving up the moral high ground. He was proud of what he had done as president, he was proud of his career in public service, and believed that he was misunderstood in aspects of the Watergate saga. But in addition, he never really had the sense of having committed a crime. Now, one of the things that history is confronted with as a result of President Ford's visionary act in pardoning Richard Nixon in September of 1974 is that Richard Nixon never got his day in court. Either uh, his, his own resignation prior to being impeached meant that he wouldn't get a trial in the Senate. President Ford's pardon and President Nixon's acceptance of that meant that he would never get a trial in a court of law. So there is this sense that he is guilty as charged of specific crime. I have yet to have been fully satisfied that he has committed a technical abuse of the law. Uh, I'm not a lawyer, and there may be lawyers in the room who would disagree with me, but I find sometimes when we actually get into it and break it down that he has a much better case than is largely understood uh, as a result of the fact that he accepted the pardon and therefore took upon himself the mantle of being guilty. So I think it's up to history to sort that out. And part of what history needs to do is when a Jeb Magruder comes and says, perhaps as in an effort to expiate his own personal demons, well, you know what, I guess President Nixon ordered that after all. The PBS really ought to check and do its homework and check to see if there are sources which confirm that and if there aren't sources that confirm it. In fact, if there are sources that contradict it, journalists and historians need to give us both. Because I think a lot of people are now walking around saying they heard somewhere that Nixon ordered that break-in. As a matter of fact, it was not conclusively proven. I think it's been conclusively disproven. Um, I'm a loyalist, and I'm going to say what a loyalist says. Uh, and that's what loyalists do. I think, however, that, and I say now to my colleagues at the president, uh, presidential library particularly, that it is the documents that tell the story. And brothers and sisters, we got a lot of documents. We got 45 million pages of records. We have over 4,000 hours of White House tapes. They're all going to be open within the next three to four years. Uh, and it's going to take history a long time to sift it all through. I think, almost as a matter of faith, because I'm not an historian by trade, that ultimately President Nixon will be remembered much more favorably than he is now. But it's not going to be up to me. It's going to be up to the young men and women now coming out of graduate school who are going to write the biographies of Richard Nixon and the histories of that war. This is a very interesting question in light of, of President Nixon being a war president and President Bush being a war president. Uh, did did uh, President Nixon write or speak about preemptive war? What were his views? It's very hard sometimes for me to take President Nixon out of his context. Uh, President Nixon's specialty was in geopolitical, re geopolitical relations, reorienting America's relationship with the other great powers so that situations that would become, uh, uh, f have potential for leading to war between the great powers would be diminished. In Vietnam, his challenge was both the political tactics and the battlefield tactics of getting out of the war at a time when he was also fighting a rearguard action against the anti-war movement in an increasingly uh, dovish Congress. Regarding the possibility of him ever proactively going to war, uh, it's something that I don't believe he ever addressed. And I think he governed and commented about politics at a time when it was not something that American leaders had to face as a result of the kind of challenge that President Bush is now facing. I have no reason to think that President Nixon would not support President Bush across the board. But he, ever, he never wrote specifically about preemptive war. He wrote about the need to create conditions in the world scene that would keep wars from erupting. That was his specialty. I will tell you that when Dr. Kissinger was at the library last week, I asked him how he thought he and President Nixon would have handled the situation that President Clinton faced beginning in 1993 with the first bombing of the World Trade Center. President, uh, Dr. Kissinger said that he was absolutely convinced that both he and President Nixon would have seen what began to happen overtly in 1993 and had been incipient for many years before, going back into the uh, uh, early, late 1970s when Anwar Sadat 
was assassinated. Kissinger said that he and Nixon would have seen that not as a criminal problem and a justice problem or an investigatory problem, but as a foreign policy strategic problem and would have addressed it as such, particularly beginning in 1993 when the World Trade Center was bombed the first time. Very good. And this is the question that you probably get at virtually every appearance. Who was Deep Throat? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I thought I had, uh, I thought I had a, a um, there was, have you seen the movie All the Presents, Man? There was, a, there was a moment in All the Presidents Men when it appeared to me on a recent viewing that the filmmaker was teasing us into thinking that Deep Throat might have been uh, then Deputy National Security Advisor Al Haig. I don't believe it was Al Haig. Uh, Al Haig says it wasn't Al Haig. President Nixon didn't, couldn't conceive of the possibility that it was Al Haig. But I was wondering if someone was teasing us into thinking that it was Al Haig. So I actually wrote to Woodward about it. And he wrote back and said he'd noticed that weird little moment too when there's this implication that Robert Redford playing Bob Woodward was reaching out to somebody in Dr. Kissinger's office to confirm a story. And Woodward, in replying to my letter, confirmed that it was not Al Haig, uh, and he has told Al Haig that, and he said that publicly. Um, a group of young journalism students and their professors, a professor in Illinois last year, fingered former uh, uh, aide to John Dean, uh, Fred Fielding. Uh, there have been all sorts of other names that have been mentioned. I have no idea. Uh, I've come around to the view that there probably was a person as described by Woodward and Bernstein in the book, but I haven't a clue who it is. Anybody, any of you know? <laughs> <laughs> what Woodward has said is that when Woodward has said that it is a he, and Woodward has said that when he dies, we shall hear. What is the best book about Richard Nixon, and which is the best book by Richard Nixon? Well, all President Nixon's books are wonderful, particularly those that are still available to you on the NixonLibrary.org website. <laughs> I'm a particular fan of a book which is unfortunately not in print any longer called In the Arena, which is, I think, besides Six, Cri Six Crises, his most personal and revealing book. He talks about what he had learned about uh, war and peace and how to relax and how to organize his time and how to deal with friends, how to deal with aging. He writes about spiritual questions. He writes at length about Vietnam uh, 15 uh, years after the fact. It's a wonderful, wonderful book, In the Arena, and I would highly uh, recommend it. Um, the best one-volume book about President Nixon was written by Jonathan Aitken, a British writer. It's called Nixon, A Life. And um, the three-volume Stephen Ambrose uh, biography, though largely based on secondary sources, has many fine elements to it. There's yet to be a truly good Nixon biography, only because, in my view, no one has yet done the job of integrating Vietnam with the scandal it spawned, uh, Watergate. Uh, there's a scholar uh, in Kansas, I believe, uh, named Keith W. Olson, who's just written a book called Watergate, The Presidential Scandal That Shook America. And he has begun to do the work of putting Nixon back into the continuum of the Cold War presidency, pointing out that many presidents, beginning with Harry Truman, believed that there was nothing more important than the United States and the West prevailing in the Cold War. And each of these presidents arrogated to himself more and more authority over more and more aspects of the government as part of dealing with this indispensable and immutable challenge of the Cold War and the great twilight struggle with the Soviet Union. So that at least does the job of looking at Richard Nixon as part of uh, the wartime uh, presidency, what Arthur Schlesinger called the imperial presidency. But there still is a great Nixon book out there to be written. Any of you young historians would like to take it on. <laughs> this is of local interest. Please tell us more about the relationship between Gerald R. Ford and Richard Nixon, both before and after the resignation. They were great friends in Congress together. Um, it was uh, easy for President Nixon to turn uh, to his longtime friend and collaborator from Capitol Hill, 
uh, to nominate him for uh, vice president. Um, it was a cordial relationship. It was a warm relationship. Mrs. Ford and Mrs. Nixon liked and admired one another. And Kathy observed the relationship between the Fords and the Nixons much more closely than I uh, uh, in the years after 1974. But they s saw one another a great deal and spoke on the phone. Um, there was a distance between them, I think, that inevitably resulted from uh, the scars of the matter that they had shared together that had to do with the end of the Nixon administration, the beginning of the Ford administration. But they were both, they were both politicians of the old school. They were level-headed. They were serious. Um, they were thoughtful. They were open-minded, uh, uh, willing to forgive, but always remembering the sort of politician's long memory. And they were really uh, two of a kind, and I hope we find a way as a nation to keep uh, producing men and women such as they, because uh, we need them now more than ever. Uh, just a couple more questions. Uh, could you please tell us what you think Nixon's greatest achievement was? President Nixon would have said the war on cancer, which he um, enunciated in one of his uh, in, uh, State of the Union addresses in the early 1970s, early 1970 or 71. He believed that, um, and I think one of the reasons he said that was that he was underscoring the fact that he came from a generation of, of uh, national Republicans, and again, President Ford comes to mind, who weren't necessarily at war with the federal government. They didn't think that the federal government was the focus of all evil in the world. They believed that there were certain things that the federal government could do as long as its authority was appropriately constrained. So President Nixon pointed with some pride to the war on cancer, which was a federal initiative, to having created the environmental impact, uh, the Environmental uh, Protection Agency. Um, and he was, I think, probably most proud, however, on the foreign policy front of having um, understood the vital necessity of establishing a working relationship with the People's Republic of China. I think he felt that <coughs> change in the communist world needed to be evolutionary rather than revolutionary. He was not one for confronting regimes with which the United States had ideological and value differences. He was instead in favor of ensuring that America's interests, its fundamental strategic, economic, and other interests were not uh, hurt by the actions of these regimes, but he didn't necessarily think it was America's duty to go forth and change those regimes, except by virtue of contact with them began speaking in the middle 1950s about breaking down the walls between the Russian people and the American people. He said the two peoples of these two great countries had to be friends because he believed once people behind the Iron Curtain saw what freedom and system based on economic and political freedom could do for them and their families, they would naturally gravitate towards them. And I think right now, rather than confronting the regime in Beijing, he would want to find a way of ensuring, number one, that we don't find ourselves in another Cold War with a newly emergent China, which is going to become militarily and economically stronger in the first half of our century. He would instead want to keep the lines of communication open and assume, and he was theological about this, he assumed that ultimately freedom would win out because it was God's way. And it, God wants us to be free. And if we offer people the opportunity of finding a better way for themselves, they will insist upon change uh, uh, in their own systems. That was his, his approach to U.S.-Russian relations. And he believes he began that process, which he believed would be a long one but an inevitable one, by going to China. Last question, very thoughtful one. What is the greatest thing that we can learn from the life of Richard M. Nixon? I believe that Richard Nixon was the quintessential moderate. He was a centrist uh, in temperament. He was a centrist philosophically. He believed in what he called pragmatic idealism. And his biographer, Jonathan Aiken, to whom I referred, wrote to him once and said, that's an oxymoron, Mr. President. You may be either pragmatic or you may be idealistic. You cannot be a pragmatic idealist. And he wrote back laughingly, Jonathan, you still have something to learn about politics. Because moderation is more than compromise. It's more than accommodating uh, the other person and putting your own uh, values up for sale. It's a way of moving forward together 
out of a spirit of commonality and community so that decisions can be made uh, uh, together and uh, the nation can stay strong by virtue of its unity. I think he'd be very troubled about our politics today. I think if you look at what happened to him during Watergate, it was in part uh, a result of Vietnam. It was part a result of his own mistakes and that of aides whom he had trusted and friends whom he had trusted, but it was also because he was a moderate. Sometimes when you're in the center, that's kind of where most of the American people are, but most of the really eloquent people, uh, particularly in the media, but sometimes in political leadership and in interest groups, are on the far left, on the far right. These are smart, dedicated people. And if you're in the center, you can sometimes receive flanking fire from both sides. And I think when President Nixon began to face the possibility of impeachment or resignation, it came as no surprise to him that those on the far left, such as Father Drinan, who had been denouncing him as a war criminal on the floor of the House of Representatives, were out to get him. This was not even remotely surprising. But when he began to lose the support of his more conservative friends, such as Barry Goldwater, when he realized that his conservative base in Congress was eroding, that was when he realized it was over. And I think the Democrats learned a lesson from Watergate because even though the far left had enormous problems with Bill Clinton, who was also a centrist, there was no surprise that the far right was anti-Clinton. But if the left, during his impeachment crisis, had abandoned him in the House or in the Senate, he may very well have lost his office. But the left stuck with Clinton, blocked the, uh, his conviction, and permitted him to survive. And I think in doing so, they, uh, they learned a lesson of Watergate. So I think Richard Nixon was a great philosoph philosopher of the American middle. He called it the silent majority. Uh, he called it true America. He sometimes called it middle America, but it was a very nuanced view. He understood that most Americans make their decisions issue by issue are essentially very sensible, essentially grouped someplace in the center. And he was a little bit of a political high priest of that, and I say as a Republican that our party uh, could learn from his example. And I thank you all very much. When John just shook my hand, walked off the stage, and said, thank you, good show, good show. Well, I think he's the one who provided the good show. <laughs> Let's get clear about that. Well, it was a good show. We inaugurated the 1,000-day lecture series in high style, and this cannot ever happen alone. I thank all the staff of the Ford Museum, uh, Jim Kratzis and your staff. I thank the Ford Foundation, Bob Gamble, and people who serve on the foundation, John Bob, uh, Babb. And uh, if Marty were here, we, we would thank him as well. Please take our greetings to Marty. Uh, I also want to thank the leadership of Grand Valley State University. We have a couple of vice presidents with us. Uh, uh, Mary Beth Wardrop is here, and also uh, Patricia Olt is here. I want to thank them. And most of all, I want to thank the man after whom the Hallenstein Center for Presidential Studies is named, Ralph Hallenstein, who inspires the good work that we do. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you. That concludes this evening. Have a safe drive home.